mai ko te rā, ka ao, ka ao a te ao He rā ho, tēnei kwa hura Hi a ke ai ko te rā, kia whakanui a I tēnei rā ho, kwa hura E piti mai te rā Hey, Ariki, hey, Tipua, Ingara Pauri, Iraira Que, Oro Ana, Hera Hote, Nei, Kwara. Well, we all have a right to a world free of violence and harassment, but we know in New Zealand that there are far too many people who don't feel safe in their workplaces, and they're mostly people who don't have a lot of power in their workplaces. Um, in saying that, I'm not saying that the top tiers does, does not happen, but certainly it's happening. And I'm very concerned about our young people, about our new migrants who are not familiar with our environment, and women generally. So it is a problem. I. Um, we need to do this work. I would like businesses to step up in terms of their responsibilities to keep their workers safe. Because if our workers aren't safe, they're not as productive, but also interferes with their ability to progress and secure, you know, to work towards economic security for themselves and their families. So this is a huge problem. I want government to recognize the harm that bullying, racial harassment and sexual harassment does to people. It affects them, it affects their families, it affects our public services, it affects our private services. So we need to take collective responsibility and recognize how big the problem is, recognize the harm, and then recognize that we need to make appropriate changes in our laws so that we can better ensure that and uphold that fundamental right to be safe and to be free of discrimination and violence in the workplace. I'm calling on government to look at our accident compensation laws, to look at our workplace safety provisions to see uh, where the gaps are there. For example, there's no definition of bullying in our legislation right now. So the onus is on the person who has suffered to, you know, to convince people they are suffering harm. We need to take that onus away from, from our survivors. We need to place it on uh, workplaces who have a duty of care under law to ensure that people are safe in their workplaces. The Human Rights Commission funded uh, this new research. It's just been released. It's the first time we've looked at what is the prevalence of bullying and sexual harassment and racial harassment across the country, across industries, up and down the country. So it's very, very comprehensive. And quite clearly, when we're talking about racial harassment, our Pacific and our Asian whanau um, report a really high prevalence, over 60% prevalence of being of experiencing racial harassment in the last five years. When it comes to bullying itself, our disabled workers reported the highest levels of suffering bullying in the last five years in the workplace. When it comes to sexual harassment, around 30%, regardless of gender, generally have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace in the last five years. These are numbers that government need to pay attention to. These are numbers that our leaders in the business world our business owners, our, our workplaces need to pay attention to. These are numbers our unions need to pay attention to. We've got a huge problem. Perhaps before we didn't have the information, now we do. It's nationwide, it's across industries, and we need to act now. So one of the very concerning factors that the research has shown is that very few of those who have suffered racial harassment or bullying or sexual harassment, very few actually make formal complaints in their workplaces. And a lot of that is put down to lack of faith that they will be believed or they will be heard. So that's a really strong message that having a policy in your workplace is not the cure for eliminating abuse of power. So it's really important we pay attention to that. And my call out to all of our workers, if this is happening to you, reach out to MB, reach out to the Human Rights Commission, reach out to your employers to act. But if they don't act, do not tolerate this violation to your dignity and to your basic rights. If necessary, reach out to the police.
Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome everybody. Um, ko netoku ingoa. My name is Ned and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this webinar hosted by the New Zealand Human Rights Commission today. I am one of the advisors here at the Commission. I work for about uh, esteemed panelists today, Samoa Mali'i, Dr. Karanina Sumeya, who I'll be introducing later on. But I'll start first in the way that is Tika and with an opening karak here so that we can begin our discussions today. So we all join me to Kiato. <coughs> Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina ki na ki uta, ki a mātaratara ki tai. He hi aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihei mauri ora. So welcome once again everybody. And by way of background, um, <clears throat> I'd just like to explain a bit about our role as the New Zealand uh, human Rights Commission, we are a national human rights institution and we have a role in advocating for human rights of all peoples. And one of the subject matters that we work on is looking at the right to uh, just and favourable work for all peoples in the country, no matter what their ethnic background, their visa status, their gender identity, their sexual orientation um, may be. And so we look at often what are some of these barriers that exist to equal employment opportunities. And so we're very pleased to be able to launch the report today that creates a credible body of evidence so that we can all advocate for systemic changes um, across government, across businesses, across private and public sector. And that is presenting on the prevalence of workplace bullying and harassment. Now, firstly, I'd like to introduce you all to the panelists today. Firstly, we have Jocelyn Rode who is the co-lead for Kantar Public in New Zealand. She has over 25 years experience working with public sector and she um, consults on a broad range of policy areas and is recognized as an expert in delivering complex methodologies and tackling sensitive topics. We also have joining with us today, uh, Xavier Walsh, who you can see on the screen now. Uh, Xavier is a young member and a leader of Unite Union, currently holding the position of co-president Together with the trade union movement, Xavier strongly advocates for the end of violence and harassment in the workplace. And we're very pleased to be able to make the connection with Xavier and the union. And then finally, we have uh, Samnua Mali'i, Dr. Karanina Sumeo, the Equal Employment Opportunities Commissioner, who I referred to earlier. Uh, she's of Samoan descent and having spent her majority of her life here in Aotearoa promoting and advocating for economic development social and employment interests of all marginalized peoples. She's also the proud mother of a son and two daughters. And so it's with that mission that she constantly works to ensure a better and safer world of work for all. I'd like to now uh, pass the microphone on to uh, our Equal Employment Opportunities Commissioner, just to give a few words and to <clears throat> give a brief overview of this research, uh, what you saw was need and what it is that you and the commissioner are doing the space. Over to you, commissioner. Yeah, tēnā koutou, mā lōri soi fua, mā lōri langina mā. Good morning, or is it afternoon? Doesn't matter. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, making the webinar today. We're very, very excited. This is a very important piece of work in terms of the human rights landscapes uh, taking forward for all of our peoples in the workplace. Um, I want to thank Jocelyn and her team at Kanta for producing this piece of work, taking in all the feedback. And I want to thank you also, Xavier, for making your time here today to represent uh, the, our, our young people and, um, and, and providing that work uh, our voice today. This is what the report looks like. Um, I don't know if you can read backwards, but it is experiences of workplace bullying and harassment in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So we're just putting some final tweaks on it and then the report will be available online, uh, should be there latest this Friday on our website. Um, but everything that, or the data that we're going to talk about today is contained in that report. And again, uh, it's been a huge undertaking. Um, when I first uh, took up um, advocacy for, um, for, for better, for, for our um, for, for our people in the workplace, it occurred to me that we did not have um, 
a strong evidence base in terms of the prevalence of racial harassment and sexual harassment um, and bullying um, at, a, at a national level. Um, so this report gives us that baseline, certainly for the Human Rights Committee, it gives us a baseline because when we looked at um, the design of it, we, you know, we wanted to explore in terms of what, what, does this, what does the landscape look like for our workers with disabilities? What does it look like uh, for people who were not born in New Zealand, but, but settled, have come to settle and, and call New Zealand home? What does it look like for people who own their own businesses or volunteers, uh, contractors and so forth? And then are there particular industries where, where the risks are higher or where, or where the prevalences are, are, are higher than, than others? So all of these questions uh, have been able to be captured by Jocelyn and her team. Um, and then importantly, um, in terms of people who, uh, who have been exposed to these behaviors, um, what's it like for them in terms of reaching out for help and what are some of the barriers? And then what do they suggest that we do different going forward so that those barriers are eliminated and that the employers um, can help to, to nurture a, a workplace culture that is safer and more respectful. So we're, we've learned a lot from the study. Most certainly a couple of key things that have jumped out is fundamental right to access to health, to health care and also rights to justice. Um, and these are really, really big systemic questions that we need to, to take forward. Um, so I'll stop talking from here and I'll hand it over back to Ned and Jocelyn for us to get started, but you'll hear more from me soon. But again, thank you very much um, to our team for the piece of work. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, it's great to hear the background as well as sort of better understand, I think for all our audience members, um, the importance and really the significance of this work. But I'll use the time now to um, really kick, right into, kick off right into it. Um, I'd like to now refer to Jocelyn from Kantar Public, New Zealand, to take over and um, really take us through the overview of the report and its findings. I mean, I note that, of course, this, this is a huge piece of work. Um, and we, you know, we could go on for hours and hours to talk about so many of the findings. Um, but so for today, I'd uh, say so Jocelyn will have some of the key highlights um, that we can all use and take over. So over to you, Jocelyn. Kia ora, Nes. Namihi nui kia koutou iti Okay, uh, let's start today just by briefly summarising what the purpose of this research was in terms of the key objectives. The main aims of the study were to measure the extent to which sexual harassment, racial harassment and bullying uh, occurs in the New Zealand workplaces and the characteristics of that harm. We also looked at who was affected, how people are impacted both in the short and long term, and how people deal with these experiences and what support they need. We carried out an online national survey of more than 2,500 workers. Now the survey is demographically representative, it's been weighted to census data, and we boosted young workers in hospitality so that we could particularly drill down and look at what was happening for them. Fieldwork was conducted reasonably recently in May and June of this year. The questionnaire was around 15 minutes and we cognitively tested it with a number of Māori respondents to check for interpretation and also missing dimensions of what we might be measuring. So we'll jump into the research findings. Forgive me for going through these fairly quickly, but we have limited time. Let's start with looking at sexual harassment. So there are three separate measures of sexual harassment. The first is the lifetime prevalence of people recalling that they have been sexually harassed in their working life. So for this measure, we use the term sexually harassed. So 17% of the New Zealand workforce uh, report experiencing being sexually harassed at some point in their working life. The second measure is a behavioural measure. So for this measure, we didn't use the term sexual harassment. What we did is we showed respondents 11 different types of sexual harassment behaviours and asked them if they'd experienced those in the last five years. So from that, we can see that 30% 
uh, of workers have experienced at least one of the sexual harassment behaviours that we measured. This suggests that um, workers who experience sexual harassment don't necessarily attribute it to the term sexual harassment because the lifetime prevalence is so much uh, lower. The third measure we look at is bystander uh, prevalence. So this tells us that 23% of workers are aware of sexual harassment happening to other people in their workplace in the last five years. If we look at um, the behavioural prevalence definition, um, not surprisingly, women are more likely than men to experience sexual harassment, 38% versus 23%, but men do experience sexual harassment as well. And the quote on the right-hand side of the, of the screen is, is one from a, um, a, a man. A senior female leader sexually harassed me when I complained nothing was done, jokes made about me, taunts such as a white man in your 40s, you should be flattered, anyone is interested in you. So this chart shows us what types of sexual harassment are experienced. The, now, in the bold there, you will see what we call net categories. That's the percentage of people who said at least one of the categories that are in the text below that bold heading. Uh, so we can see there that 25% of workers experienced crude or offensive behaviour, most commonly unwanted sexual remarks or jokes at 22%. 20% of workers experience some kind of unwanted sexual attention, most commonly unwanted uh, physical contact or touching, sorry, most commonly unwanted sexual remarks or jokes. And we can see that 13% uh, experienced unwanted physical contact or touching or sexual assault, and 5% experienced some kind of sexual coercion. Uh, all of these figures were significantly higher for women than men. On this next chart, we look at the uh, behavioural prevalence figures for sexual harassment across different demographic groups. And what we can see here is it tends to be particularly high among younger women, among bisexual workers and disabled workers. We also found that sexual harassment happens across all industries, but um, as you can see there on the left-hand side of the chart, it tends to be more common in the healthcare and social assistance sector. We also saw quite high prevalence among younger workers in hospitality at 43%. Next, we look at racial harassment. 15% of workers recall being racially harassed in a workplace setting in their lifetime. So again, we've used the word racially harassed in that definition. When we just use a behavioral definition where we showed respondents 12 different types of racial harassment behaviors, then the prevalence figure sits at 39% of workers experiencing some kind of racial harassment in the last five years. And we found that 29% of workers um, essentially witnessed uh, bystander workplace uh, racial harassment. So they saw, saw it happening in their workplace in the last five years. So what types of racial harassment are workers experiencing? Uh, the most common ones you can see at the top of the chart there. So most commonly racial jokes at 24% and race-related derogatory comments uh, at 19%. Um, someone mocking your accent or making fun or deliberately pronounce, mispronouncing your name at 18%. We can see that the um, prevalence figures, particularly for the top two, are significantly higher for Māori and Pacific workers. There's also some other interesting uh, ethnic differences on that chart. Lower down, you can see that 22% of Pacific workers and 23% of Asian workers have had someone at their work insist that they only speak English at work. So here we can see those prevalence figures by ethnicity. So over half of Māori, Pacific and Asian workers have experienced racial harassment in the last five years, compared to only 39% of workers overall. 
When we look at racial harassment by the demographic groups, we can see that as well as being more prevalent among the minority ethnic groups, racial harassment is higher for disabled workers uh, at 61% and migrant workers at 61%. Industry, we can see racial harassment certainly occurs across all industries, but it's particularly um, high in the healthcare and transport sectors at 50% and 47% respectively. Next, we look at the prevalence figures for bullying. So we have a lifetime prevalence of 40%. So 40% percent of workers reported being bullied at some time in their working life. For the uh, approach that we use for the behavioural pre prevalence figure, this is a little bit different to what we use for sexual harassment and racial harassment. Here we showed them uh, a list of 10 different bullying behaviours and we uh, identified them as being bullied if they said that they always or often experienced at least one of those behaviours. So we focus there on behaviours which were frequently and repeatedly experienced. So using that definition, one in five workers have been bullied in the last 12 months, so that's a shorter period as well. And in terms of the bystander workplace prevalence in the last five years, that's at 44%. So what are the most common types of bullying behaviours experienced? Uh, being set up to fail in your role at 10%, repeated reminders of your errors or mistakes, 9%, being ignored or excluded 8% and persistent criticism of your work and effort at 8%. In terms of demographic, bullying is highest among younger workers at 29%, also disabled workers uh, at 52%, bisexual workers at 39% and Pacific workers at 26%. Bullying varies across industries. For example, it's twice as likely to happen in retail trade at 26% than it is at, say, education and training at 13%. We see a particularly high percentage of bullying uh, in the hospitality sector for younger workers at 38%. Let's look at what we know about the perpetrators of harassment and bullying. So on the very left hand side of the chart there, you can see that bullying and harassment can, can be carried out either by one person or multiple people. Um, if it happens in a work related event, we found that it was much more likely to be um, multiple people uh, doing the perpetrating. In the middle there, you can see that men are more likely to be perpetrators of harassment and bullying than women. However, women are involved as a perpetrator for 52% of workers, if you add that 28% and 24% together. On the right-hand side there, we can see that power dynamics are in play. So for 53% of workers affected by harassment and bullying, the perpetrator was a boss or a manager. And for 30%, it was a more senior co-worker. So what do we know about the impact that harassment and bullying has had on workers? Well, for nearly 90% of workers who've experienced harassment or bullying, the impact is negative. And for nearly 3 in 10, 29%, they describe the impact as largely or extremely negative. So quite serious. So what are the impacts? Um, on this chart, the dark green refers to the immediate impacts experienced. Uh, so we can see overall 83% of uh, affected workers experience some kind of immediate impact. And the lighter green uh, refers to the ongoing impact. So 63% of workers uh, experience some kind of ongoing impact from their harassment or bullying. So on the left-hand side there, we can see that 64% of workers experienced an immediate impact that related to their physical or mental health particularly anxiety and depression. And this has been an ongoing issue for them for over a third, 37%. Over half of workers felt the uh, harassment and bully bullying impacted their job or their career. So most commonly they found it was harder to perform their job and those types of impacts were ongoing for them for a third. On the right hand side, we can also see that loss is uh, loss of self confidence is quite common at 46%. 
So pathways of care. Well, it's not uncommon for people to keep their experiences to themselves. 29% didn't tell anyone about the harassment or the bullying that they had experienced. So what kind of uh, support do people seek? On this chart, we show the results in two different ways. Um, the blue figures are for those, all workers who experienced harassment in a negative manner. The gold figure relates to those who experienced more serious um, harassment or bullying. So overall, most workers sought some kind of support, but what you can see there is, is almost always informal support. So most commonly through family and friends or through uh, a work colleague. You can see that very few workers who were affected sought uh, help through counselling or advice from a lawyer or a union, uh, and very few sought assistance from government agencies like MB or the Human Rights Commission. Only one quarter of workers uh, raised a formal complaint. Now, this was slightly higher for the more serious cases at 33%, but it still is only sits at a third. When a formal complaint, it's most likely to be submitted through the workers' workplace dispute resolution procedure at 13%. And the outcomes of the formal complaints um, is pretty mixed. So over four in 10 workers who made a complaint, 43% were dissatisfied with how it was handled. Um, and this dissatisfaction increases uh, to 59% when the impact of the harassment and bullying was large or extremely negative. So why do people not make a complaint or seek support when they experience harassment, bullying? Well, as this chart shows, there's a number of different key reasons. There's fear of the consequences. 45% felt it might affect them negatively. 28% of workers with more serious cases felt too scared or embarrassed to do something. We can also see that workplace culture is an issue. 35% said it was accepted behaviour in their company and that complaining would make no difference. We can also see distrust in the system. 44% of workers with more serious cases felt that their complaint wouldn't be handled appropriately. And many also felt that um, there wasn't a clear or adequate reporting mechanism in place. A quarter of workers negatively impacted by their experience and a third of more serious cases felt that they needed more support than they got at the time. So what do workers want? What are they asking for? Well, we can see here that there's a wide range of different things that have appeal. But if you look at what's most common, they're looking for something independent. Someone independent looking into the workplace culture and policies at 31%. Um, some kind of anti-bullying and harassment training for people in their workplace. Uh, support to make an, a complaint internally within their workplace. And some kind of independent free service to help resolve the situation. Uh, Counselling and mental health support services also uh, up there. But yeah, really a full range. So... Um, as part of the survey, we uh, collected people's stories and um, we were quite um, moved actually just by the number of stories and how much people were willing to tell us in a survey. So a big thank you to all the participants who took part in the survey and was willing to do that. We'll just leave you here with um, one quote uh, from one of the respondents who shares the impact that um, his experience has on him and in particular his desire um, that he wish he had had a voice. I had been bullied over a long period of time and the senior bosses continued to support the bully. They got a, they got a lawyer, I could not afford one and the stuff their lawyer was saying was very untrue. But I was in a very vulnerable position and just accepted a whole lot of things that I regret. I wished I'd had a voice back then. I'm trying to work through it as I don't want it to impact on my life, but it makes me angry every time it jumps up in my mind, which is a few times a week. Thank you. Well, kia ora. Thank you, Jocelyn, for your presentation. Um, 
And thank you for summarizing some of the data for us um, so succinctly. Now, I think um, there's, a, there's a lot for everyone to take in, and I see we've already got quite a lot of comments and questions going through. Um, it, it's quite overwhelming the, the what the numbers say to all of us. And I think now's a good time for just to me to lead into our other panelist today, Xavier, who um, is a young worker as well as a union delegate. Uh, um, delegate. And I'm just thinking uh, <clears throat> it would be great to have Xavier's views on also your reactions to some of this, the, the raw data, the quotes that we've had, and just talk about, um, you know, as, as a young worker, as a union delegate, what some of that means um, for you. Over to you, Xavier. Kia ora, Ned. Um, <clears throat> and kia ora, kota, uh, kia ora kota. Um, As I've been introduced, you know, my name is Xavier Walsh and I'm co-president of Unite Union, the hospitality and entertainment union. Um, I just first like to thank everyone um, who has worked on this report. A lot of work has gone into it, as I'm sure you can all see. Um, I'd like to especially thank Ned, Rajna, uh, Sonor, Ma Mali, um, who I've worked with in this process. Um, yeah, I guess uh, the results of this report uh, are certainly quite um, damning. You know, as a young non-binary queer person of colour, um, this report has been quite insightful and shows that harassment and bullying in the workplace is far too widespread. Um, you know, going into this, when I heard that there was like a lack of um, a strong evidence base of harassment and bullying at a national level, I thought that that was uh, completely wrong. Why don't we have you know, information which backs up what a lot of people are saying? Um, you know, I think that um, you know, the sheer number of people who have experienced sexual harassment behaviors that were measured um, actually to some extent isn't shocking. Um, we see it in our workplaces. We hear our friends in Fano talk about it or, um, and you know, we know it's wrong. Um, in fact, that nearly one in three workers have personally experienced sexual harassment in just the last five years is wrong, especially with the high prevalence among young people in the hospitality industry. So I've also been asked to share uh, some of my personal lived experiences, you know, my story, with bullying and harassment in the workplace. And I must admit that while it has at times been difficult to share, I hope this is, you know, something of a small step to improving people's experiences and just getting the stories out there because I'm not alone when I talk about my experiences. My experiences are just one among many. Um, and I first started talking about my experiences more publicly at the launch event for a Safe World of Work campaign. And that's where I met. Uh, Sonoma, Mali, uh, which started me down this journey. Um, so this is my sixth year in the hospitality industry. I really feel that at this time, I've sort of come to see and hear it all. Um, yeah, and so now as co-president of, of the union, which represents um, a lot of these workers, um, I just keep hearing a lot more. Um, I keep you know, seeing real workers experience this and something has to change. So, you know, when I was 16, um, I was bullied by my boss at the time when he used to call me fat and that I should go for a run. Uh, this and him verbally abusing myself and another coworker in front of customers, other staff on numerous occasions really does stand out to me and my memories of that workplace. One of my first proper first uh, part-time positions as a young person and uh, as a teenager, just trying to earn some money. So, but, you know, every time um, he said or did anything I found to be particularly harmful or hurtful, I had to remember why I needed the job. Like, I needed this job far more than I disliked his remarks. That's why I stayed on for two years. Um, that's why it was, you know, worth staying on for two years because I really needed a position, you know, but... I guess at 17, though, uh, I was really glad that and grateful that I'd be moving on to a new job. Um, yet, you know, what I didn't realize at the time was that I would come to experience a new problem, and that was 
sexual harassment in the workplace. You know, for nearly three months as a 17-year-old, I used to be fondled by a co-worker every time I worked with them, sometimes upwards of a dozen times on shift. And uh, whenever we would have a break together, they would chat me up. Um, you know, this was quite hurtful. Um, clearly, like, as a young person experienced sexual harassment, um, that was quite difficult. But what was worse was trying to speak up to be honest. Um, you know, I was a high school student um, who tried speaking up to multiple managers um, on multiple occasions. I think I asked my restaurant manager at the time uh, upwards of six to 10 times if I could have a meeting and every time I wasn't given the time of day. Um, uh, you know, and while now I feel as though I can't blame them, you know, they didn't really find the time for me. The system didn't find the time for me as a teenager just trying to work a part-time job, but trying to speak up about something that happened, which really hurt me and really affected me. Um, so I ended up writing an email to my boss and my manager, thinking that they would take me seriously if I managed to write it down. It took a lot of courage, it took a lot of time. Um, and so, but what would take, uh, what was it, uh, you know, what I thought would be sort of a more quick resolution process would end up taking months just to get a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so I could sit down and discuss with them. Um, really though, that email, which I sent to uh, two people uh, had actually been um, shared uh, to upwards of four other people without my consent, just making this process a whole lot uh, more difficult. You know, I thought that I was getting a face-to-face -face without prejudice meeting. Instead, I was met with two salaried managers, an employment lawyer, and uh, my own employer. I honestly, at the time, felt quite mobbed and ambushed by that event. Um, like many who experience uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, the effects of both primary and secondary traumatic experience, that is, the acts, act or acts themselves, and then the secondary uh, trauma, which can occur from um, trying to speak up or, or not being taken seriously, is what I have to deal with and what so many other people have to deal with. That includes um, trying to deal with the arduous sensitive ACC sensitive claims um, process, so they can try and get therapy or um, the police. Uh, and you know, if they um, manage to speak up, uh, that might be the Human Rights Commission, MB, uh, the union, a workers' representative, a lawyer, whoever that might be, if they have the privilege of being able to be in that position. Um, you know, we heard that uh, in, the in the hospitality sector, sexual harassment is uh, more common with 43% of uh, hospital workers aged under 30, uh, 30 years having had experienced uh, this form of harassment in the workplace. And that's, you know, frankly, not good enough. Um, we know it's not good enough and it should never happen. Now we now have the data and this is good, but action is important. As was discussed earlier, um, you know, there's a wide um, range of actions that need to occur, whether that be a more personal action by employers specifically or um, legislatively. You know, I firmly believe that the next steps after seeing and hearing this report and seeing uh, the effects of violence and harassment in the workplace should be that Aotearoa ratifies the International Labour Organization's Convention 190, the Violence and Harassment Convention. And um, uh, it's the first uh, international treaty aimed at eliminating violence and harassment in the world of work. Uh, the convention and the campaign to ratify it in Aotearoa is one that will help give a better definition and acts of redress to the victims of violence harassment in the workplace, including gender-based violence and harassment, which we've heard is a problem. We know it's a problem. All workers should have the right to work free from violence and harassment. It should be considered a minimum standard of work. And ILOC 190 is the first treaty to recognize as such. You know, what makes this our convention so essential is that it protects everyone, regardless of their status at work, from any form of violence and harassment in the workplace. No worker should ever have to choose between their mental, physical, sexual integrity or dignity and their right to work, ever. So hopefully we can you know, be part of that change. Hopefully this report can help that. Kia ora. Oh, Ngamihi Xavier, um, really thank you for your powerful speech just now. I know 
I know I was enthralled just listening to you. Um, and I think this is now a good time for us to go into uh, questions and answers. I think we've had quite a lot of interest from all our participants today. And I think just everyone would um, like to have a huge thank you to the, our panelists who've just provided us with so much to think about. Now, um, my our first question from the audience, actually, I think I'll, I'll combine a couple of comments um, at, which leads up to this question, but we've had quite a lot of comments about people who have ex talked about that they have experienced all the various negative behaviors in their workplace and the result being that nothing happens because uh, as someone who experiences it, you know, you have to face the bully or the burdens on you to, to, to raise something, to make a complaint. And that's, very, that's a very scary thing to be able to muster up the courage and so the question then is, um, I'll, I'll give this over to you, uh, Commissioner. Are there any current policies at government level or are there any government mechanisms that are go actively going around trying to hold employers, companies, workplaces accountable for creating or supporting unsafe workplaces? Yeah, uh, the really, really good question. But before before getting on to I just want to thank Xavier. Thank you for telling your story. And um, there, there may be others who are listening in, um, but just listening to your story um, may also be triggering uh, their memories in terms of what, what, what has happened to them in the past also. Uh, please, everyone, um, you know, seek support um, if, if about discussion today. Uh, is triggering uh, triggering memories for you. Um, what's clear from the research is um, that people live with the impact of bullying and harassment for many years, and it's not visible to others. So please uh, find support. Uh, talk to us at the Human Rights Commission if you wish to, or to MB also. But thank you very much, Xavier. Um, this is one of the this is one of those problems. It's having to, as, as you say, Xavier, when you were seventeen. <laughs> having to sit and be confronted by, you know, with, with managers from HR and a lawyer, you know, that experience in itself, as you say, um, is, is re-traumatizing. And so at the moment, um, if you're going to uh, make a file for grievance, you actually have to uh, inform your employer that you're going to do that. Um, and in the Human Rights Commission, that, that is not a requirement. Uh, for you to inform your um, your employer that you're going to um, raise a complaint with us and seek help for us in terms of mediation. But there's a huge power imbalance there. Um, the thought of it alone will be enough to silence victims. So that's definitely something that we need to address. It impacts our ability to access justice, which we are all um, entitled to. Um, so that's a short response to that, um, Ned. Unfortunately, it's it's something we have to fight for in terms of legislation change to remove that onus off the victim and to build in some protection. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, and um, it was definitely reflected um, in the data as well um, when Justin talked about how so many people just chose not to do anything about it, I suppose, reflective of this is the current system that we have. It's something for um, us at the Commission to think about further in terms of um, the next steps in terms of our advocacy. Um, but going back to that data then, that I've got one question here for Jocelyn, who might be able to go a little bit more in depth. And the question says, um, if, I wonder if the Kantar team could discuss the methodology a bit more in particularly, in particular, how they ensure that the sexuality and gender identity diversity is representative and accurate. Um, note that it's interesting that the bisexual work has showed up as most research doesn't even reflect this as a, a population in the samples. Over to you, Jocelyn. Thank you, Ned. Um, so we sample people from online panel survey, uh, online panels, uh, and had a, a set of demographic quotas to make sure that we got good demographic representation, including, for example, um, looking at household income by household size, just to make sure that we got good representativeness across all the different socioeconomic groups. 
We also boosted that sample by using the electoral roll, electoral roll to sample young under 30 years of age uh, workers in the hospitality sector. In terms of identifying the gender and sexuality, those uh, variables obviously self-defined. For gender, we use the Statistics New Zealand approach, which is to ask what is your gender with the category of another gender, and then the respondent is able just to type in or write in uh, what their gender is. And we also asked a, a fairly straightforward question on sexuality as well. Um, sometimes the data is limited in terms of sample sizes. For this survey, we had sufficient sample sizes to look at heterosexual, gay, lesbian and bisexual in terms of those three categories. Um, and then for gender, we had sufficient sample sizes just to look at the male and female for that. So there's some limitation to that. But essentially, that was the approach uh, that we used. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Um, and I, I just want to sh share my thoughts on how um, I thought it was um, really amazing that the research was able Science was able to disaggregate into all the various components, or at least at the commission, what we consider the prohibited grounds of discrimination. And it was very useful to be able to see all the different uh, reported experiences. I've got another question here, which uh, I think will be good to, to give over to Xavier in your capacity as both as worker and as a co-president of the union. And um, it's this one that I think we've all sort of been going here back and forth about, and it's whether you think um, <clears throat> it's better uh, for people to go through a, a formal complaints process or whether an informal complaints, uh, you know, raising the matter informally would be more preferable do you have any thoughts on that, Xavier? Uh, thank you for the question. I suppose um, <clears throat> it really quite depends because both processes have their, um, uh, they differ quite a bit. Um, both have their limitations and um, one could be better than the other depending on the circumstance. But for some people, um, they often find that, uh, you know, um, having a conversation, a less formal approach, um, can be quite helpful for more uh, things which can be sorted more easily, um, whether that be just like slight remarks or the likes. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the thing with formal, um, the formal process is that it can be quite a lot for a person to deal with. Um, it really depends on the individual and their circumstances. But um, yeah, it's just the barrier to entry for a formal process can be quite high. So is that something to be kept in mind? Yeah, thank you for that, Xavier. Um, and as you say, it's, it's there's, a, there's a lot for, I suppose, for people to consider when going through it. Um, now just looking at the time and um, I'll just, uh, wrap up with maybe perhaps a couple more questions. This next one, we'll take it back to um, our commissioner, um, Sano Mali'i. Um, and the question for you is that, uh, well, comment is that it's great, but also sad in a, in a sad kind of way to have the, the figures uh, of so much prevalence across our workplaces. And the question for you is that going forward, with the information collected now, uh, do you have any ideas on what effective remedies and interventions could be so that we can all have a safer world of work? Over to you, Commissioner. I mean, that's, that's a question not, not only for the Human Rights Commission, but for our unions and our businesses and our, you know, our, our health providers, um, you know, it's a, it's a question for all of us to come to come together and sort out. Certainly, if I think about what the stats are saying, um, 
those most at risk, uh, the disabled, um, city of Pacific and our ethnic minorities uh, groups, uh, young people. You know, if we think about pay gaps, those groups are more most likely to also be the ones earning the least. So they can't afford lawyers to be fighting for them. They can't afford to wait two or three years for their cases to be resolved. If they file a, you know, if, if they file a report and go to the employment courts, we we have to create a system that is centered on the person calling for help. And at the moment, that is not how it feels. And so it's not a mystery that people give up. And unfortunately, in the extreme end, people um, have harmed themselves and certainly have um, ended their life. That is not the sort of workplace that we want. That is, we, we don't want to be known as a country uh, that continues to close our eyes to that. We need to look at our policies. We need to make sure that our, um, our, our accident compensation, you know, look, look at those legislations and make it easier for people to obtain health much quicker. Um, we have this question of thresholds. You know, do we meet the threshold for bullying? Um, Currently, our work safe, uh, this work safe definitions um, requires um, an act to be repeated or certain behaviors to be repeated. Um, you know, after listening to a number of our young people in hospitality, there, there are behaviors there that you don't want repeated on anybody. One act can be enough to hurt and harm and traumatize. So we need to revisit our thinking about these things we call the thresholds. If we make it human centered, then that will help us move forward. Uh, certainly, I think the unions have a, a huge role in terms of helping to, to you know, to, to shape something that is that is very worker centric. Um, and one of the things that came out of the study, Jocelyn, you may correct me, is that the majority of the people who responded were not part of unions. Um, so they don't necessarily have that backup to, you know, to, to call on. Um, you know, if I think about small, small businesses, you know, quite a number of work for of, of people that we've we've talked to, you know, work in small businesses, they don't have those large um, human resource departments, you know, to to help provide that that sort of independence between someone who's making a complaint and someone who's led to have cause uh, to, to cause the um the harm. So it has to be a fit for purpose, appropriate. Um, another thing that's come out of the study is there are particular industries where the prevalence is high. So for men, uh, the, da the data points to manufacturing, construction, and uh, communications and those sort of industries. You know, Is there a particular way you can engage those particular industries to think about the cultures um, in their workplaces um, and then create something that's more, that, that would suit them? Certainly the public service, um, you'd expect them to do much better. But what, we, what we've heard from here is that the public service itself, um, even with all its resources, is still um, you know, not the ideal place um, for victims of bullying and harassment. So it's a very, um, it's, it's, it's not too hard if we decide that we put the workers at the center and then we make, we make the system um, we work the system of support um, around them. But certainly access to justice is a big issue that's come out of this study. For the most vulnerable, for the ones with the least resources, access to justice is a huge, is a huge barrier. And, um, and access to health support in terms of therapeutic support is huge. The economic consequences for people who are suffering from these practices is huge. It impacts their ability to live. It impacts their ability to provide for their for their homes, their their, their households. It's it's multiplied, and studies like this will help give us the evidence now to go door knocking on those who have uh, power in business and in government, um, and certainly with uh, union allies um, that we must step up and, um, and step up urgently. Thank you, Commissioner. That that was. Very, very insightful and um, sort of highlights how much work needs to be done further on this. Mm -hmm. Now, just picking up on your last point about 
um, the work of our, our union allies, we're getting um, quite a lot of comments about the, the Coalition for a Safer World of Work and the convention. I, I think this might be a good time to pass on to Xavier, yes. if you'd just like to talk to, um, tell, tell, use the opportunity to talk more about um, the coalition um, the, and, and the convention and where people can go to sign the petition. Over to you, Xavier. Uh, yes, thank you for the question. Um, so the Coalition for a Safe World of Work is a um, is a project being run by the Council of Trade Unions, um, uh, interdisciplinary group, a union group, um, a group of unions which come together to make change in uh, New Zealand. And so um, that work is being undertaken by the Vice President, Rachel McIntosh. Um, and it's really quite something because the CTU has been part of this work um, to try and ed eliminate violence harassment in the workplace um, since the convention um, sort of uh, be started to begin at um, uh, regional conference at national uh, at the yearly conference, uh, the International Labour Organization's yearly conference. And so um, this is a great opportunity for people to get involved and. To, um, you can sign uh, the petition at the website, which put in the chat. Um, it's just really quite a great opportunity to uh, try and get uh, eliminate violence harassment in New Zealand and Aotearoa. So it's an opportunity for that. Thanks, Xavier. And just as you, as you were speaking, I've, I've, I've put the campaign uh, website into our chat box there for people to go and have a look. Um, read about the convention itself and see um, the wonderful work of the people behind it. Um, going through, there is perhaps room for one more question, or, or, or possibly two, but we haven't <clears throat> explored then. Um, I suppose one question for Jocelyn that I have here, Jocelyn, is that um, the comment is that it, it the, the, there is real value in data like this, and it shines light on a very important and invisible problem in our society. And so uh, what would your recommendations be for any um, other research in this work? And what are some of the unanswered questions that you would still like to see answers for as we go forward? Uh, I think when we were analysing the data, you know, you, you keep thinking about it, wouldn't it be great to do some qualitative research here and sit down and, and listen to people's stories face to face and hear what it's like for them. Um, and that would be an opportunity to delve into the findings in a bit more depth, for example, um, to start to understand why is it that certain groups of the population are experiencing disproportionate harm. Um, also more diagnostic understanding around the pathways of support. So what works for people and why and what doesn't work for people and why and really getting that diagnostic understanding. Um, and I know that the Human Rights Commission have also um, mentioned in the past the possibility of doing some kind of economic analysis on the impacts. So that would, you know, be, an, be another interesting point of um, exploration and research in the future. Um, I'll just jump in. Justin, one of the really important um, findings is, is the bystander data that you had for all three categories. Um, you know, I, I think that deserves a whole conversation in itself in how to how do we empower bystanders to to act up or, or intervene. Um, Xavier, at 17, I'm sure you would have appreciated if another adult had stepped in and supported you right at that moment, you know. Um, and, and that's what I mean in terms of training for bystanders, uh, giving them permission, I suppose, uh, to intervene in, in those moments. Because, you know, if, if, think if, if they've seen something that's just not right, that will also sit with them in some way and it will, it will hound them. Um, so how do we equip those? They become sort of like secondary layer of, of, um, of affected persons. Um, so, you know, that's a, so that was a really important finding, I thought. I mean, 44%, mm -hmm. 
and when it came to bullying, of of people were aware of you know that sort of behavior going on in in their workplace, and about twenty three percent were you know were aware of sexual harassment going on in their workplace. So, you know, the figures are quite significant. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and the other thing that I thought was really interesting with this particular study is that um, there were more men uh, participants than women. Normally in surveys, you get a lot of um, you know, the female respondents dominate, whereas this one, 53% of your respondents were men, I thought was really, um, was really interesting. So it obviously it resonated um, with men to respond to this issue. So I think that's significant as well. That's great. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'm just, I'm just conscious of the time, noting that everyone here has given up their lunch hours, so I might wrap it up there. Um, unless, um, no, no, no further matters. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up there just with some acknowledgements. Um, so firstly, thank, thank you to the, all the panelists for your time today and the rich discussions we've had, as well as, um, the significant points that you've all raised. Um, I know certainly for me, I definitely want to see a safer world work for everyone. And so where they can enjoy the right to just and favorable work conditions. And so with that, I'd like to thank also all the participants who have come today. You know, the more voices that we have that call for change, the better. So on that note, I've, I've also just put in the chat box a reminder that um, <clears throat> the website of the campaign, which Xavier has talked about, um, led by the Council of Trade Unions, I acknowledge uh, Rachel McIntosh, who's here today, who's behind that campaign to ratify ILO Convention 190 to see government take on a bigger commitment to eliminate violence in the workplace. And I've also put in our chat box the Human Rights Commission's 0800 number, for, and which is a toll-free toll free number for people that wish to make uh, complaints of human rights abuses to us, as well as a link uh, f- for uh, mental health services around the country. And so in closing, <clears throat> Once again, I'd just like to thank everybody today for their time, their, their work, their respective advocacy streams, and just the uh, huge amount of interest um, that we're all on the same path towards. With that, um, I hope that with the data that we have now and with the report in my hand, which uh, we'll have hard copies out very soon, is something that I hope we can all take away and use in our respective roles. I'll close now in the traditional way with the karakia, and then we can all be off and enjoy our lunches. <clears throat> ke whakaira te tapu, ke wātea ai te ara, ke tūruki whakataha ai, ke tūruki whakataha ai. Homie, huie, ai ki e. Thank you very much, everyone. He tangi ki te pauri me te aroha, he tangi ki te a. E takahi a te ora, e takahi a te wairua Moe mara Tangi ki a ranga roi mata ki a uta moe Kua whari ki a to aroha re a tūra Yeah.